Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Thomas Toth, and welcome to Boston IVF and our QA sessions. I'm uh, excited and honored to join you tonight, and I'm interested in learning about what's on your mind tonight. <clears throat> However, I was told that I need to introduce myself, so maybe we'll start with that. And uh, as I said, we'll look more forward to your questions. I was born and raised in Missouri, um, mostly in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and uh, had an amazing opportunity uh, to be selected to a, an accelerated uh, program, undergraduate medical school combined in a six-year program. It was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Ironically, uh, my second year, was trapped in a, uh, in a Friday night with nothing to do, I was not wanting to study, and I found a a Life uh, magazine article, uh, front, front cover, which showed a, a beautiful picture of a little girl sitting on a lab bench. Her name was Elizabeth Carr. She was the first IVF baby in the United States. I was struck by that from that moment on and uh, really was my guiding force of passion and interest in trying to figure out how in the world that could happen. I was uh, very fortunate to be given an opportunity to come to Boston and train at the Harvard uh, programs at Brigham and Women's and the Mass General for Obstetrics and, gy and Gynecology for my residency training. Um, it became a dream come true uh, to be invited to the Jones Institute, uh, which were the pioneers in IVF and were responsible for Elizabeth Carr in that, uh, that uh, moment where I saw uh, that uh, cover uh, article. So to come back to join them was simply, as I said, a dream come true. Um, that's where I got to do my fellowship training program and then had another opportunity of a lifetime to be invited back to Boston to start the first IVF program at the Massachusetts General Hospital and uh, served its director and founder for over 25 years. Uh, an opportunity, a very excited uh, opportunity to join Boston IVF occurred in the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center to open a new practice in downtown Boston in the financial district and also to help start the only IVF program in New Hampshire with my colleague Dr. Uh, Wright. I continue my academic endeavors by helping uh, my dear colleague Alan Penzias with the training of our fellows at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston IVF. I continue my research interest, uh, my majority of my uh, basic uh, research involved around the fundamental underpinnings of human oocyte cryopres cryopreservation. We had the first human trials in the early 90s, and our efforts in introducing natural sugars was translated around the world and is now the standard of care for oocyte cryopreservation. More recently, I've been interested in how we're going to democratize IVF by uh, introducing automation to make IVF more accessible, affordable, reliable, so that uh, folks besides the lucky ones in Massachusetts or New Hampshire where this might be covered, this should be uh, available to everyone and everyone. Family building should not be, uh, 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 it's not a, uh, it's, a it's a fundamental, uh, it's a fundamental uh, part of us and uh, it's not an elective process and uh, certainly uh, deserves uh, more around the world. So I'm going to stop because uh, that's enough. And I'm more interested in learning about questions and seeing what's on everyone's mind and, um, and having a lively discussion. So let's stop there and uh, if that's okay and we'll, we'll jump into some questions. <clears throat> let's see. I have some questions popping up. Um, Let's see. Marvelous. So, what could we do uh, to give some insight about the idea of democratization of IVF? And I think uh, what we're seeing is that society is just asking everyone to to delay. They're asking us to get educated. They're asking us to 
find the right person. They're asking us to find the right job uh, before we can start our family. And that's just not happening before age 35. And so we're forced to find ourselves uh, trying to pursue our passion of life building uh, when we're on the harder side of nature's curve. So I think we're finding that our efforts at family building is becoming more and more relevant every day. Um, IVF started out as just a, a treatment, uh, as I look back when we began IVF with pregnancy rates that were extremely low. It, we were so proud of 15 or 19 percent pregnancy rates and now our rates are routinely in the 50 percent range. Uh, so much has changed that from before it was a random rare act that we could help someone with infertility to treatment now incorporates many folks who may not even have infertility as much as how do we help them build healthy families and how we can uh, assist in that. So that's become a major focus and I think will be a drive for the future. Let me see if you can pause and check for other questions. All right. Let's see. Here we go. Um, I have a, a, a wonderful question, uh, a simple question. So Alyssa, Alyssa asks, can you explain what happens at initial consult? What do we need to do to prepare? <laughs> it's a great question. Frankly, the only thing it takes is the courage to show up. Uh, fertility issues are so personal and so challenging that once we just have a chance to start a discussion and conversation, the worries and seem to just happen naturally. So, frankly, uh, if you can come with a great deal of interest and passion and uh, transparency and sincerity, it's about all we really need to begin uh, an important uh, conversation, discussions, and how we're going to learn to help you. So uh, you're not a project manager. You don't need to, to do anything but uh, be, uh, be available and speak, uh, speak from your heart. Our goal is to teach folks to become good students, to listen to their head and their heart so that decisions we're going to be making together really become lifelong. There's no magic about that. And uh, over-reading or over-analyzing sometimes by hearing what others say or uh, on the internet can be even um, uh, distracting. So uh, I think coming and bringing as much information as you can and knowledge and open-mindedness is really the fundamentals of that. And the rest just happens, or at least it should. And a good rapport uh, takes uh, a little bit of time so that we develop a good team effort in our, in our approach to how to navigate this life challenge. So that may sound like an oversimplified answer, Alyssa, but it does come from the heart. And uh, certainly our team will ma help you with records and arrangements. You'll have a team of your administrative folks, nurses, financial counselors. Everything will be taken care of. So it doesn't take much uh, other than letting us help you. I'm going to pause again and see what other wonderful questions are popping up. Oh, I got a nice note from Anne Marie. Very common question, how successful are some of the less invasive therapies, such as an IUI? How can they help folks, young folks with maybe no obvious fertility issues? We sometimes use this word called unexplained infertility. Uh, it may not sound very nice, but it's a very favorable situation. And uh, when it comes to helping folks uh, achieve fecundity, if we want to speak in that language. What's the expectations of a pregnancy per month? With our therapies for folks who may be suffering from fertility, we can bring your pregnancy rates essentially back to what two fertile individuals would experience. So that would be in the 15, 20 plus range per month. It doesn't sound overwhelming. Nature is very selective. There's no question about that. Uh, but we can bring with some very less invasive, simple therapies, bring our pregnancy rates up to what uh, we would have expected. Uh, so I hope that uh, alleviate some of the concerns that uh, these therapies aren't effective. They're extremely effective 
been giving us the chances that uh, two fertile uh, individuals would experience. So um, uh, less invasive therapies are a wonderful tool, especially for those who might be uh, fo so fortunate to have age on our side that we have the time and ability to restore uh, normal fertility rates. Let's see if I can find another good question. That was terrific. Uh, here was a good question. I see a question around studies about AMH levels. Anti-malarian hormone is a very common biomarker of ovarian reserve that we use to help us individualize or personalize uh, someone's status. What it doesn't predict though is natural fertility, but what AMH levels do, anti hormone, which is secreted by these resting follicles, primordial follicles in the ovary, it's kind of those seeds that you might have that if you put in a pot and add water, they don't all make flowers, but the more seeds you have, better off we might be. So AMH levels are very helpful in predicting how someone may respond to fertility drugs where instead of nature selecting one egg, could we gently help nature select two or three? Or if we were thinking about in vitro fertilization, could we get 10 eggs? So these types of markers are very helpful in help us predicting how someone may respond and how we can individualize and personalize not only um, our, our prognosis or success rates, but how do we make the treatment uh, fit, uh, fit each person individually. Do levels go up or down? There's some, uh, uh, there's some variability, as anything in biology, but we don't see a, a significant change after a birth that things would go up or down, unless there would be uh, some other event that could occur that would be quite significant. So I don't think we would ever look at these uh, values as an as a absolute truth. They're just biomarkers, and there is some variability as uh, we go through uh, life. It's, a, it's an assay. And, it has its own intrinsic uh, limits, but we do use them commonly and you'll hear about it a lot, as well as other biomarkers of ovarian reserve. You'll hear us talk about antral follicle counts, something we studied 25 years ago and published on the use of ultrasound exams to measure these small resting follicles as another marker of what's the cohort of eggs that might be available in any one month. Each of us may have a very different, it's like playing cards and how many uh, cards are we dealt with each hand or each month it gives us an idea about the cohort, which helps us individualize our treatments. You'll hear us also talk about other markers of uh, ovarian reserve, looking at FSH levels, follicle stimulating hormone, sister hormone, luteinizing hormone, and estrogen or estradiol levels. All of those act as a help in us determining what someone's status might be and to various treatment options. But again, never predicts uh, natural pregnancies. Uh, so we have to be careful not to overinterpret those things. I'm going to pause another moment and see if uh, I could answer another question. You know, there was a, there was a great question being raised. Uh, give credit to Jane and uh, Laura. Um, COVID, COVID-19, it's turned the world upside down. I'm speaking to my patients with telemedicine, thank goodness, and it's allowed us to continue, but clearly it's been a, a significant stressor. In fact, at Boston IVF, our team has uh, developed during the middle of the pandemic when Massachusetts was uh, suffering a great deal, when uh, the Department of Health actually asked those uh, operating rooms to and weren't providing life-saving uh, therapies to to uh, to to stop treatments uh, at that time that were thought to be less than uh, life-saving. And it was amazing when we did a survey of all of our patients at Boston IVF. Many of you may have participated, but. Uh, uh, a very 3,000 of us particip participated, amazing uh, results. And it showed, despite a pandemic, despite all the things around us, our worries and fears of our family, worries about our work and job, employment, 
some of the basic life fears and stressors we'd ever can imagine. When our patients were asked about how to categorize their stressors, it was remarkable that whether it was January to March when things were really quite dark to June or even now, consistently our patients would, would rate the number one stressor infertility, again, above all others. And that was an eye-opener for us, that this is not something that can be ignored despite the challenges around us, and I can't imagine a larger one for us as a, as a, as a global uh, community, that family building is a major, major uh, driver of our, of our being and that it can't be ignored. And uh, I think this has been very helpful as we've published this and follow-up studies to come, uh, that uh, we will, as healthcare providers and as infertility specialists, Family building is not to be ignored, and we will need to navigate this no matter what's coming up. So I think others around the country realize this and around the world. You know, some folks would say, gosh, infertility, it's, is it that important? Well, can you imagine um, in the world, in the United States at least, 2% of all our babies are born through the help of assisted technologies. And when you look around the world, as we look at the Northern European countries in particular, it's reported somewhere between six, eight, and approaching 10% of, of uh, our little ones are through the help of assisted technologies. It's not going away. And we need to make it more accessible, affordable, and easier to use. We need to make it less stressful. And this idea of COVID, we've learned that more than ever, how do we make these types of treatments um, easier? And your team is quite important, uh, thoughtful, uh, uh, nurses, and uh, the use of acupuncture, the use of other mind-body programs that Dr. Domar and others at Boston IVF have brought to the forefront has been essential in us learning and helping our patients navigate such a challenging life issue. And how can we make things just a little bit easier? And I, certainly, uh, our patients deserve it. Uh, they have a lot to manage and uh, can affect self-esteem, relationships, and that's not acceptable. So not only are the technological developments we've talked about and are proud to speak about, but I know that in the future and currently, we know that uh, the ability to provide our care in a thoughtful, uh, uh, personal way is uh, as important as anything else. So count on us. Uh, uh, we, you should be able to guarantee that we will take the very best care of you such a, during such a time. I hope that it helps answer the questions that uh, COVID's a scary thing, but we're managing it. As you can imagine, a fertility practice where you know, we've always uh, masks and gowns and gloves, you know, the meticulousness of what we've done has always required it. So it's not a major change. Yes, we have to accommodate some of the things when it comes to distance and waiting rooms. And uh, we have been able to do that, but uh, our care is essentially unchanged and we'll continue to be that way and uh, in more ways we're more motivated than ever that uh, this need is, uh, is, 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 is essential. Let me stop for a minute and see if, any, if there's some other questions I should address. Well, I got a nice <laughs> note from Donnie. Um, Donnie, you stepped into that beautifully. She's asking about the Bedford Boston IVF practice that when will it be performing procedures and so forth? And I'm happy to tell you that in 2021, that's going to happen in the early part of 2021. We don't have an exact date, but I know Dr. Wright and myself and the team are extremely excited to see that happen. Uh, New Hampshire deserves it. And uh, we expect within first quarter of 2021. But believe me, you will be the first to know because uh, along with our Facebook and other uh, ways of reaching out to patients, you're, you're going to know and there's going to be a lot of excitement as we all uh, prepare for that. It's a beautiful facility. Uh, gosh, I'm proud to, 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 to anticipate what we can do and uh, I think you'll, uh, and, and the New Hampshire deserves it. So uh, we're all excited and thank you for asking. I know Dr. Wright's been anticipating this for some time and I'm thrilled to, to, to help her get that uh, rolling.
Oh, I, I have to, I want to, could I just take a moment? I got this beautiful note from uh, patient uh, Alyssa, and she sent a nice note about her uh, wonderful pregnancy. And, you know, it may sound strange, but when our patients do share uh, their stories and share their progress in pregnancy, uh, it's a privilege because it's uh, sharing uh, life's joys with us. And uh, there really isn't a greater privilege or motivator. So believe me, these notes, even when we're at distance, uh, a text or a, a, an email with a photograph or an update, uh, trust me, our nurses, our team uh, get very, very excited. and We love to share and learn. So if anything you could do is keep us connected, especially during this time when things seem more remote, uh, that personal connection means everything. So um, thanks for, didn't expect to get a nice shout out. So well done and keep it up. Whatever you're doing is working, as I might say. So don't change a thing. Um, let's see. I'm looking through a few things. Oh, let's see. I'm seeing some notes about uh, some metabolic uh, issues that are quite important to our family building. I'm seeing questions about our thyroid function or androgen levels, polycystic syndrome. These are very, very common uh, endocrine factors. Rest assured, uh, that is part and parcel of what goes into our evaluation is understanding, uh, if you will, the lay of the land. We need to know your endocrine system inside and out, which many times, if that's a simple fix, we can uh, simply uh, correct the uh, uh, an underlying endocrine factor and help folks just get pregnant the old-fashioned way, which is, uh, is, uh, is really the goal. huh? But if not, uh, the endocrine system needs to be normalized before we'd ever consider any more forms of elective therapies. We need to make sure thyroid endocrine levels are normal. We may be checking insulin levels and helping folks managing these metabolic issues, which uh, you'll hear a lot about diet and exercise. Uh, there are wonderful components of this. There's no way around it. We want us, everyone to be as healthy and ready for a family building as possible because it does translate into our future offspring. So uh, paying attention to our health and status now only makes the success rates of our therapies uh, much improved. It also makes for healthy families down the road. So uh, these types of uh, evaluations and therapies would be expected in routine. How do we normalize? How do we uh, help uh, nature be at its best? So uh, yes, um, that's expected and to be part of it. I hope that answered some of those questions. I have a question for Marjorie. Uh, she asks an important question. Is the, do we practice IVF at Portland, Maine office or do patients travel to Boston? This is another uh, example of the privilege of working in the largest, uh, largest provider of assistive technology in the United States, frankly, uh, certainly one of the largest. That Boston IVF has a dedicated practice in Portland, Maine and uh, you would be able to have all your care close to home, and that's the way it should be. And that goes back to accessibility and affordability and reliability. Uh, that's really our goal. And uh, 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 you would have a, a tremendous opportunity and, and uh, experience in uh, meeting my colleagues uh, at uh, Boston IVF in Portland. So, no, you don't have to travel, and that's our goal. And you're seeing Boston IVF develop uh, these important practices throughout the region, if not the country. With practices in New York, uh, practices throughout Boston, and as well as Massachusetts, Southern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, uh, uh, New Hampshire, as we've talked about. Uh, we have uh, a lot of, uh, I think, accessibility, and we're only going to improve that and push it. So. That's one of my initiatives and why I was so thrilled to start their new practice in the financial district and helping in New Hampshire and also expanding our approach uh, throughout the country. So, uh, yes, you're covered in Portland. That's terrific, huh? Let's see. 
what else could I address? A question was raised about number of embryo transfers, how many embryos and so forth. Well, I got to admit, when we first started IVF in the late 80s and early 90s, our efficiency was not what it is today. And so we had the uh, opportunity at a time we would transfer maybe more than one embryo to enhance the odds of, of, of a success to occur. But as our practice is refined, uh, our therapies have improved, our media culture, our techniques, equipment, it's, uh, it's been a quantum leap, uh, if you will. And it goes back to uh, 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 something I was taught very early in my career that despite the fact we're working in a super physiologic way, if you really can mimic nature, that's really the ultimate goal. And so by now we've gone from several embryos to now we routinely just transfer one embryo to mimic nature and having one pregnancy at a time, which clearly is the safest in the way nature has us designed. So on occasion, embryos split and even then we have uh, uh, twins and and the joy of that. But nonetheless, we want to de-risk this and, and not only make the pregnancy risk lower and uh, health the mom and baby improved, uh, it also allows for uh, a chance to build families kind of the old-fashioned way, one at a time. Um, and with the use of cryopreservation, uh, something, as I said, I was very interested from the very beginning, with modern cryobiology, if we are so fortunate to have a cryopreserved embryo, the, the success rates of an embryo surviving a freeze and thaw is 98%. So uh, essentially we're having the opportunity to uh, make time stand still, which <laughs> doesn't, happen, doesn't happen in real life often. So uh, you could say suspended animation. So if an embryo has been frozen at, when we were at a younger age, that embryo is still going to act as we were when we were younger. So it's more of the age of the egg than the age of the uterus. And so a frozen embryo can be used at a later time with as much efficacy and safety and reliability as if the embryo was transferred fresh. So it's common now that we stress the use of a single embryo transfer. Yes, on occasion that those of us with more advanced age where the risk of miscarriage might be higher, uh, we have the option carefully thought through about transferring more than one embryo, trying to weigh those risks and benefits. But overall, the field has moved from transferring several embryos to what the current status now is, transferring one embryo at a time. So I hope that answers your question and offers some reassurance. We always strive for the highest pregnancy rates, but I would like to say we're striving for the safest pregnancy rates. So, uh, and we're very confident in what we can do. And so we don't want to maybe uh, over, over uh, use our abilities and uh, weigh them carefully as we go. I hope that's helpful uh, to a very important question and kind of highlights how our field has extraordinarily changed from days gone by. So I'm very proud to share that. Let me take a look at some of the other questions popping up. Let's see. Um, oh, we have a very, uh, a very heartfelt question. Uh, so Christine asks a question about after suffering miscarriages. Um, what, what can be done to help? Uh, there's, there, uh, you know, it's not talked about a lot. It's such a natural phenomenon, but as you've learned, folks don't mention it much, and we suffer in silence. But if you ask anyone in the room, if anyone suffered a miscarriage, you're going to see so many folks raise their hands that you never would have dreamed. Miscarriage rates are, are, are related to our maternal age as well as paternal age. Uh, we have good data that show that as we cross that line at 35, the risk of miscarriage starts getting into the 1 in 4 range. 
And as we get closer to 40, it's one and two. I guess you could say nature is very, very protective and selective about these things, which I suppose is good. It just, it certainly doesn't feel that way. And as someone raises the question after two losses, it can be very, very uh, unsettling. And uh, how terrible feeling that is, of the unknown and what the future may bring. I would like to say, though, before we would want folks to suffer too much, that's where you should be coming forward and letting us look at some of the common causes of recurrent miscarriages, we might say. Um, what tests could we do to give us some insight? Could there be something we could do? What's the cause? What treatments might be available so that no one needs to suffer a miscarriage unnecessarily? And uh, I'd like to stress that those kinds of tests would be routine for us. And, um, and with that information, we can help identify, well, what are the odds that will happen again? Can you have reassurance that, goodness, there wasn't something that could have been mended or fixed? Thanks for taking that weight off our shoulders, and we're ready to try again. It's not uncommon while we're doing these kind of testing, which typically takes one menstrual cycle or one month. Uh, we may ask folks, they may wish to avoid pregnancy because they're so concerned about another miscarriage. So giving us an opportunity to provide some reassurance and testing, and clearly if there is something easily mendable or fixable, which is not uncommon, we're going to do that and help folks just carry on and be successful on their own. And, and the odds, even after two losses, when our tests don't really show an obvious reason, the odds of a successful pregnancy are still way, way in our favor, much more than a flip of a coin, 60, 70 plus percent, maybe not 100, but clearly in our favor. In those situations where uh, folks are suffering and we're not getting the success we prefer, uh, we can assist with uh, reproductive technologies. In fact, we can even test embryos uh, with pre-implantation genetic testing. We can biopsy a few cells of an embryo and look to see if it could be an embryo or embryos carrying certain common uh, aneuploidy or genetic glitches, chromosomal errors or mis uh, misarrangements, if you will, that can help us narrow down or potentially find that embryo that may be more meant to be. When we're so fortunate to find an embryo that is thought to be genetically competent, it raises the chance of that embryo being more successful, having a full-term pregnancy develop, gets much more than 50%, 50, 60, uh, close to 70%. Not 100. There's still things that we don't understand or know, but, uh, but it can be a good tool for those who've suffered and uh, less, uh, less invasive or more conventional therapies have failed. Uh, there are things we could do on top of that. So, um, good question and heartfelt one. And uh, one that we also, besides the technical things we do, we've touched upon it before. And how do we manage the stress of something that's so unfair? Someone didn't, you didn't cause, it's not your fault. But what could we do? And that's where a lot of discussions in our uh, support systems and counseling, uh, which should be part and parcel of what's going on, how to manage uh, such a life challenge. So we have a lot of uh, wonderful uh, 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 support systems that folks maybe don't talk about enough to, that are unbelievably satisfying and helpful uh, when we hit these rough, rough, rough patches in life. So count on us to not only look after the technical sides, but how do we just look after you and uh, how do we help you through something that's not always explainable and challenging? So count on us. So let's stop at that for a moment. And let's see if I could answer any other questions. You guys are on a roll. Jane uh, asked another question about having failed, let's say, IVF therapies and we don't understand why we're getting eggs and they're fertilizing and embryos are growing and we're putting them back and it looks like the embryo endometrial lining looks terrific. It can be very unsettling and, and challenging. And some folks, I mentioned before, those with recurrent miscarriages, but especially those folks of us who are over 35 where we know the miscarriage rate is higher, might wish to have genetic screening of their embryos to 
help us not only therapeutically improve their outcome, but also diagnostically better understand if there is an underlying factor we weren't aware of. So genetic screening of embryos is carefully discussed and needs to be the risks and benefits. It's just a tool. It's uh, not a it's not a cure, if you will, and so we need to look at those very carefully. But clearly folks who have failed multiple attempts, some additional testing before just continuing another IVF therapy makes a lot of sense and is necessary, in my opinion, um, for us to look for those more rare occult factors, to narrow things down before investing emotionally, physically, and even financially in additional therapies. Uh, I think our patients need to feel confident that uh, all uh, rocks have been turned over and looked at and that they can be confident before making another uh, attempt at a therapy that they're doing everything that they could to be successful and, and feel confident of that. It's amazing how the body follows the brain. So if someone understands what's going on, is comfortable with what they're doing, it's amazing how the body can follow. It sounds a little corny, I realize, but from a scientist, but uh, over and over again we've seen that. Let me pause. I'm going to take a quick sip of water and then let's see what else's questions are coming. I wish we were more live and interactive, but this is better than not. Oh. <laughs> All right, all right, I can pause for a minute. We were talking some serious things there. I just got a, a beautiful note from Lisa. Um, she's celebrating uh, her daughter's birthday at two. She certainly was a miracle baby, so we're, gosh, two, it's amazing, Lisa, how that time could fly. But uh, listen, enjoy, enjoy, especially now. Uh, we don't appreciate these gifts from above, and... Uh, and uh, you earned it, and you worked very hard. So uh, enjoy now, and we'll be there for the future if you need us. And um, It's good for folks to hear uh, some positives. We're only hearing a lot of negatives, but uh, it's good to hear. Uh, we, we can help the majority of our patients. We just can't always predict exactly when. For the most part, we can help just about everybody, and one way or another we certainly can, but just with... What we prefer, most, I'd say the odds are, you know, two thirds. So uh, thanks for reminding us that. And uh, we sometimes focus on the, the things that don't happen, but for the most part, we're helping everyone. So that's fun. Thanks, Lisa. There's a lot of questions coming out about are there things we could do that might improve our results and uh, it's not uncommon for us to want to almost we'll do anything and so supplements are commonly talked about and whatnot I, I think it may be the most important thing I ought to say before we continue that discussion is we know for a fact that folic acid has been proven in North American women to dramatically reduce the risks of uh, birth defects, spina bifida, these very common, not uncommon issues. So uh, that's the number one uh, thing we should stress to our patients as they think about their family building is several months in advance, the initiation of folic acid. It's required at least 400 micrograms and some of our patients we've seen in publications and our own results show that 800 micrograms may put us in an even more favorable range for those suffering from infertility. Um, it's commonly touted, uh, various supplements, and I, I think there's some uh, something to be said about that. But I also think there's something to be said about some of the old-fashioned things about eating your fruits and vegetables, sleeping well, watching our diet, exercising. They don't sound very sexy, but uh, they're extremely true. And that's been well proven. Uh, Harvard School of Public Health and my colleagues and I have published extensively on this, so it just doesn't sound very sexy, but it's very true. So uh, continuing those important lifestyle issues and avo avoiding environmental factors, certain plasticizers, you know, that we can have that you might find commonly in shampoos or perfumes or uh, certain materials that have plastic and other. So those things we can control a bit. 
Some supplements may be of help in those who might be very deficient. Um, I don't know if that's a common situation, but there could be re reasons that certain antioxidants could be of help. So I don't think we would dissuade folks, but we also don't want to think that if we just pop a pill that takes care of, every, care of everything. So I think a judicious use of everything, everything in moderation, is a, always a good uh, is always good advice. Let's take a peek at some other questions. Um, I see a question that came up, a technical question that I think is very important as we learn and hear so many things. There was a question about assisted hatching, pros and cons. Um, assisted hatching uh, had been used in the past more frequently not as much often now as because of our ability to grow embryos outside the, the body, if you will, and our culture environments are so much more friendly and efficient that we're able to see embryos grow much more efficiently outside the body to growth day five or six or seven to a blastocyst stage. And so we can actually see our embryos uh, as the, they begin the process, as it sounds old fashioned like, like chickens, we have to hatch to, to implant and to develop a pregnancy. And so with the ability to grow embryos longer, we're seeing which embryos are hatching on their own. There may be occasions in which an embryos don't seem to be hatching effectively or the covering of the embryo is artificially thickened or hardened that may uh, be a, a reason that assisted hatching could be applied. Uh, but as I said, in the old days where we were growing embryos two or three days outside the body, we're now able to watch embryos grow with great deal of confidence and safety and efficacy. So the common use of assisted hatching now is reduced as we can pick those embryos that are behaving the best. And indeed, if there were to be an issue, that would be able to be detected and we could plan and use the, these technologies more judiciously and not just uh, by, uh, by rote use. So I hope that helped you was answered your question. I'm just looking through. There's so many names and faces that are see again too. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, uh, it's 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 to me always fascinating to listen. Um, what are people thinking about? What's making them uh, worried? Or uh, uh, many times we're suffering in silence. So uh, it's nice to have an opportunity in these question and answers to folks to throw things out, and maybe it breaks the ice, which allows uh, uh, our patients to feel more comfortable in coming forward and realizing they're not the only one. My goodness, uh, uh, because of the way society has evolved, where more of us are being waiting longer and having to wait longer, that fertility issues are, are not uncommon. Maybe one in four, one in five uh, folks uh, are, are needing some help in their family building. So uh, this is not a, an uncommon event. In fact, it seems to only be growing a need around the world. Family building is such a precious uh, commodity that uh, countries are uh, finding ways to help uh, afford and to uh, help uh, folks pursue fertility because it's an important part of, of not only life but to the well-being of, uh, of countries and of us as a society. So uh, I don't think you're going to see fertility treatments ever disappear, quite the opposite. So that's a real privilege. Never expected when I think back to our first experiences in IVF where it was, where it was used for such uh, narrow, isolated issues to where we now see we're helping folks build families in all different ways. And uh, to me, that, what a privilege and a joy. And that's why I want to keep pushing the field that we need to be able to do more and make it more affordable and accessible. So um, it follows a good theme tonight. Let me pause and see if there are any other new or additional questions or if I haven't addressed something well, I could revisit that. Oh my gosh. I uh I just got this I just got this little note here. 
Uh, let me, can I mention it? Someone asked me, where would I go anywhere in the world to have lunch? I mean, my goodness. Um, I got an answer. Uh, my mother came to the United States uh, from Greece. I have so many cousins uh, in Greece that I would have loved if I could go back and have uh, a lunch in a little, little, in a little village on the sea. Uh, I have a place in mind that if I could see my cousins and just have lunch for an hour, uh, that would be a real, uh, real joy for me and have my family with me. So, ah, you're making me feel sentimental. Thanks for keeping us uh, balanced, I guess, huh? That was very kind of you. Let's see. I have a, another important question related to crowd preservation and frozen embryo transfers. Again, when I think about things, the most common therapy in our, in our uh, fertility treatments now is uh, frozen embryo transfers. It's because the success rate of freezing is so good. It's because our technologies are so good, we're trying to mimic nature. So for the first time ever, we're doing more frozen embryo transfers than fresh embryo transfers, which some would say is a, a big achievement because the risks of ovarian hyperstimulation are essentially disappear when we put the embryo back in an unstimulated environment. Some would argue, and some research being done here at Boston IVF and the Beth Israel, is looking at what's the potential benefits of a pregnancy that develops in a more natural setting, whether it's a natural cycle, uh, unstimulated, or if we're putting an embryo back uh, with, a, with a spontaneous ovulation, or when we add small amounts of natural estrogen and progesterone to mimic a normal cycle. That's an area of great interest to me personally. We're looking for the safest and best outcomes and downstream uh, efforts. So our field has evolved to the point now that we don't just talk about can we become pregnant? What's a pregnancy rate? We really are focusing now on, well, what's the health and safety of our, uh, of our, our, our pregnancies and offspring? And uh, uh, to me, that's, that's phenomenal, isn't it? So um, the debate right now is, when do you put back an embryo in a, in a natural cycle? Well, we watch nature. We can monitor with ultrasound, determine when someone may be ready to ovulate, so we can then put that embryo back when it should be. And with ultrasounds and blood tests, we're pretty quite good at that. And that's becoming even more popular than ever. We've also, for 30 plus years, have had the ability to program hormone replacement by giving small amounts of estrogen and progesterone so folks can be a little more confident exactly the day they want to put the embryo back because we're essentially overriding some of the idiosyncrasies of nature. Natural cycles are wonderful, but as you know, we're all biology. And I sometimes use the phrase, we're not like Coke machines where you put the quarter in your ear and everything comes out the same. So uh, from cycle to cycle, when nature is making its egg mature, ripe, or ready to ovulate can vary. And so it requires a little more attention and availability. So we commonly use both of these uh, techniques to put back our embryos and... Uh, the idea of endometrial receptivity is uh, extremely fascinating and one that you're going to see a great deal of publications. In fact, at the recent American Society for Reproductive Medicine International meeting, uh, I believe uh, Boston IVF had an extraordinary uh, number of abstracts related to endometrial receptivity reflecting our, in, our internal interest on how we're going to improve the ability of putting in one embryo at just the right time. How can we raise our success rates and improve uh, health and outcomes? So I'm fascinated by this, and you're going to see significant publications from Boston IVF with our, our fellows and with our uh, faculty members putting a great deal of interest and expertise and science behind this. So hang on to your hats. We have more to share and more to show, and you're going to see it, all of it. We, we like to share our publications. You can find them easily. And, uh, these questions and answer sessions will be another opportunity to go over cutting edge information that we're learning and bringing to the table and offering you and our patients on a daily basis. So, terrific question. Mm. 
Oh my gosh, here was a cool question from Evan. He was bragging about um, uh, his daughter was from a frozen embryo from four years ago. Again, you know, I love cryobiology, so I'm, maybe I'm picking on those, but uh, it's amazing that, as I was saying, that an embryo is frozen in time. There's at minus 196 degrees centigrade, coldest temperature on the face of the earth. There's no molecular activity. The cells are essentially at complete rest at a suspended animation. So it is, to me, even someone who's studied this for almost 30 years, it's just amazing to me how we can thaw an embryo and it will pick up just like uh, it was frozen uh, a minute before. And it could be four years, five years, even up to 10 years. Our work with egg freezing has allowed folks who might be finding themselves in a tough situation and may have to delay their family building. The use of frozen eggs is a way of helping manage some of these unfair life situations and challenges. So uh, you're going to see some publications from one of our outstanding senior fellow and from other faculty members, including herself, about the use of egg freezing at Boston IVF. We have the privilege of publishing, uh, soon we publish, uh, one of the largest series in the world on the use of egg freezing when folks are coming back and, and their outcomes. And I, I shouldn't say too much because I could get in trouble, but uh, the outcomes are uh, quite amazing that no one really has reported. No one's had any good data to suggest uh, in strong language what might someone expect. But it's in that 40% range, which is uh, pretty extraordinary for all comers. So, Let's talk about that later, maybe, or it'll come up in other questions, but um, it's amazing what we can do with the technology that we've learned and afforded, and always with a great deal of respect. Uh, uh, any of our techniques and technologies always require very careful, not only uh, respect uh, from biology, but from socially on how we bring new technologies to the table and how we make sure we're doing it in the right way and, and a thoughtful way. So. It's a good reminder we can get hooked on technology, but uh, it does require a sensitivity and approach that, uh, uh, well, that's what experience has to do and years of, and that's what I see at Boston IVF as uh, such a leader in the field that um, we can provide that context, that texture, uh, that, uh, that intangible that goes along with uh, the care we provide. So thanks for bringing that up. I saw um, I saw a question about whether we put an embryo back on the fifth day of development or the third day. It's a common question. In fact, Boston IVF is before the pandemic struck. We were set to provide the world's largest randomized controlled trial in trying to decide is there any advantages or disadvantages. We know that for some folks where embryos aren't growing well outside the outside the body that putting an embryo back on the third day may have a potential advantage. So clearly that's a common approach uh, that we provide. Nothing's perfect. On the other hand, a randomized controlled trial, we're going to study that so we can help us determine uh, all advantages and disadvantages and uh, shed some great deal of light. So I think you're going to see that at Boston IVF, we're really striving because of our, uh, our interest and in size and uh, breadth of our practice that we, we don't want to just provide care, we want to lead the field, which means we need to ask and answer the questions that others either can or, or have questions that no one's addressed. We need to address them, and that's been the exciting part of our fellowship and our, our robust research program and collaborations, not only in the Boston area, which we're unbelievably privileged with uh, so many outstanding uh, biomedical uh, uh, capabilities, but we're also able to reach around the world, and uh, that to me has been another uh, unbelievable uh, benefit of practicing in a place like Boston IVF, where we can uh, work with others and answer questions that only folks used to dream about trying to get an answer to. So, um, thank you for asking these questions because uh, there's more to it. We we want to we want to move the field, and uh, you're going to see more and more 
coming to answer these tough questions. So thank you. I th we're kind of coming upon an hour as we get close to an hour. And I know uh, it's late for many of those folks, but there might be a question or two left that I could address. Uh, if not, um, that's okay too. Um, I, I'm coming across an important question at the end of the evening um, around what to do if things haven't worked so far. And I, I think that even after multiple attempts, we need to pay respect for that here. And that it may be a time to pause, get second opinions, have a chance for a fresh set of eyes to look at failed attempts and scrutinize those. Uh, folks need to understand exactly what we know or possibly don't know before they make such, such important decisions. Again, I go back to the resources emotionally, physically, and financially that comes into these um, decisions. And so they need to be handled with great deal of respect. So folks who failed multiple attempts can be unbelievably disheartened. It may be time to take a pause, get a different opinion, let someone look with an open set of eyes, and then provide a very uh, objective opinion uh, uh, to help folks decide, well, would we consider an alternative approach? How else could we succeed in this life challenge? So uh, I've learned that uh, being too rigid isn't fair because nature will always surprise us. So uh, there's never a never in any of our conversations, but uh, we, we, we have a great deal of hope we can find solutions for just about anybody. And we just need to explore them. And uh, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a text message. It doesn't happen in a simple email message. Some of this requires uh, visiting and learning and, and uh, open-mindedness. So um, I think we're really, that's what we're really about. So uh, trying to find hope and direction and guidance. And uh, I think any of my colleagues would uh, be pleased to do that when that arises. And, and we're always uh, helping other folks if our patients are suffering. Could we find one of our colleagues for a second opinion? That's very common. It should be expected. Just peeking through. I see a, a message about Kate getting back to where we started about preconception uh, uh, preparation for family, uh, healthy family building. It's uh, amazing now. In the old days, we would uh, try to guess someone's family's ethnic background. Or, uh, <laughs> we're much more diverse than we ever would anticipate. And with next-gen sequencing, new technologies, we're now offering uh, routinely the option of identifying up to 300 recessive traits. Most of us are carriers for some traits. We'll never have those diseases. But because of the technologies, and now a fraction of the cost was unheard of uh, five years ago that we could even consider this, we can look at um, our recessive traits and make sure if uh, couples are considering or family building to make sure there's no... Uh, overlap or recessive traits that we would have preferred to know about and how we could help navigate those uh, situations. They're not common, but when they're when it's you, it really doesn't matter about anyone else. So we want to personalize this. And, and now that can be a routine part of our preconception evaluation that we can help folks manage this, so that uncertainty or unknown and those rare situations that you know, we don't want to have the should have, could have, would have. And there are things we can do to help reduce or avoid uh, those risks to our potential offspring. So preconception screening and testing is a very, very common uh, option now and part of that theme of, you know, building healthy families. And maybe that's what we'll end with tonight um, is that despite all of the technologies and all the development we occurred, it's it's very simple. We, we want to help folks... Uh, achieve their family and do it in a thoughtful way with a great deal of science, integrity. And uh, I think you would find that with any of our colleagues and partners and all of the, all of the um, accessible uh, locations that uh, maybe you never would have thought of. So 
Uh, it's been a privilege. Um, I could keep talking on and on, and maybe I'll get another invitation. We could have more question and answer sessions. But if you need to reach us, uh, our office can help make connections. We're available, as I said, with our practice in downtown Boston and, and in uh, Bedford, New Hampshire. So we're pleased to do that and help you with any of our other more convenient locations if necessary. I think we'll stop at this point and, uh, and wish everyone a good evening and hang in there. Um, the pandemic is difficult. Fertility is even harder, if you can imagine, from what we've learned. But we'll help you navigate all of those at the same time. So all my best. Maybe early happy Thanksgiving. One way or another, the, those things in life that bring us joy, will probably treasure them even more in these kind of times. So uh, keep that in mind as, you, as uh, we go about getting ready for Thanksgiving. All my best. I'll say good night for now. Thank you again.